Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Decatur at the Macon County History Museum, which until earlier this year was closed for eight to 10 weeks because they wanted to renovate certain spaces and they want to open up new exhibits. And we're in one of those renovated spaces right now with Nathan Pierce, who's the executive director. Nathan, it's, it's always a hard decision, I think, to make when you say, okay, we need to make some changes mm -hmm. because there's always cost involved. Yes. And there's always, well, we got to close down, you know, and people don't want to have to see that happen either. But there does come a time, doesn't it, when you have to, you're in an old building, an old school building, I think, mm -hmm. when you ha kind of have to step back and say, we need to spruce this place up a little bit. Yes, it, it just needed a facelift and, you know, it's really a long overdue. So we, uh, what we've been do uh, doing in other areas of the building, the, uh, putting up the homeless oak panels and painting, we went ahead and got this last stretch that we just hadn't got to yet mm -hmm. in the previous winter. So yeah. at this point, we've done pretty well the whole building. So. Yeah, and you can see, I, I like this, you know, you can see you've got your lighting grid up here and you've got your, your are those called panels, those gray panels? Yeah, that you, the homeless that you, oak panels, yeah. right. And, and you affix your, uh, now I guess that, that takes a fundraising effort too because this stuff is not cheap, is it? Museum museum items are always expensive because it's a specialty item. Mm -hmm. It is, not a lot of people make it, therefore it's not a lot of competition, therefore yeah. you're going to pay for it. So yeah. luckily I had some good volunteers help me though, so we got it done pretty reasonable. Yeah. So. Good. Well, one thing you wanted to do is you, you did have a sports exhibit here and you wanted to have a, a Macon County and Decatur sports exhibit. And so you went around to the schools first, right? And yes. you said, what do you got? What can, what can you let go of? And, and they were pretty generous, weren't they? Yes. Yeah. Was, uh, most of the schools were uh, pretty easy to work with and allowed me to come in and take a look at their items. And, and we did a loan agreement. So uh, mm -hmm. a lot of them will want them back by uh, this fall when they have their homecomings and so forth. Sure. So this won't be up for a real long time, although we might swap out those areas with something else mm -hmm. too and keep the exhibit up or we'll just have to shrink it down. We'll, we'll see what happens when yeah. the time comes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was uh, one of those things where most of it wasn't our collection. We had to go find it yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, so. which is unusual for you because you have a huge collection. Let's start over here because this is, I think this is pretty, now this doesn't go way back. It goes to 1992, but yes. there you go. Yeah, let's, but that's the uh, state championship from um, MacArthur High School. From MacArthur High School, and that was the track and field state championship. Yes. And they also were able to cut loose with some, uh, some photographs too, weren't you? And these are the the individuals who were on that state championship team. Right, and there were there were more. Uh, we just didn't, we only had so much room to fit so many things in, but they let me scan all their photo collections, so I had it had it all, and then I, that way I could return it to them and keep, mm -hmm. uh, keep copies of it. So mm -hmm. that was generous of them to do so. Yeah, and uh, right next to it here, St. Teresa. Now, this is not a particularly interesting picture, except for the fact, when you look back into the, I think probably the early 1960s, this is what a, a typical cheerleading team would wear, mm -hmm. and the way they would wear their hair, and it's, it's uh, 1962. It's, it's very interesting uh, to see, you know, what the kids were wearing, and, and uh, yeah. <laughs> the gymnasium would get a little hot with the sweat. Oh, my, wouldn't it, though? <laughs> wouldn't it, though? <laughs> and no, no air conditioning, of course, either, <laughs> not, not in the gym. Um, and then this is this is interesting too because before there well this is Saint Teresa, Saint Teresa football Teresa. down here so this is still Saint Teresa, um, but uh, state champs 1974 and state champs 1975, and the state championships were held in normal. Boy, they had a heck of a team, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, had a good run there in the mid 70s. Yes, they did. And there was a time uh, with not too long. A lot of people will remember when there was only one Decatur High School. And uh, th these photos are here, and these trophies are from 1931 Illinois State Basketball Championship. Um, sometime in the, you correct me, maybe you don't know, but sometime in the 50s or 60s, they split up into into a number of high schools. They were high in schools. the 50s, 50s? I think, yeah, early to mid 50s. I couldn't tell you the exact year off the top of my yeah. head right now. So we're these, looking right now. We're looking at the co-champs from 1930, and that would have been the conference team. And then on the right, the next year. We see here that they won the state championship. Mm -hmm. So that was a really good group of players there. And if you can see, they, I don't think they coached the people to guard the way they do any, anymore. Look at <laughs> Gay yeah. Kinter, the coach there, but I, I, look how he coached, coached them to guard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> we got all these items on loan from the uh, Decatur Public School as well, too. So that was nice of them to allow that's, me to go that's through very and nice. find these things back in storage and so forth. Mm -hmm. It would be, it says Stephen Decatur High School on there, but it'd actually be Decatur High School. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, that's just a, just a, a, a mistake. Um, Hall of Fame team, Decatur High School. These, these are really very interesting. It, it also is uh, fascinating to see how trophies and ribbons and everything has changed, and uniforms mm -hmm. have changed through the years, isn't it? I love this picture up here, the, the 1930 team. Look how old those high school kids look. <laughs> Some of them look like they're 30 years old. A lot of them had already been working for half their lives. Yeah, so. <laughs> maybe some of them were 30. <laughs> and, then, and then just to the left over here, and that says Stephen Decatur, and that's not, that's not the fact, but in 1936, there's another state basketball championship team. And boy, they had some, they had a really good basketball program mm -hmm. here, didn't they? I had no idea they won that many uh, state championships. Their gym was named after Gay Kittner, the coach there for, the long, for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And then we get off into the, into the football area, and I'm not sure what we've got there. Let me see if I can get a little closer there. Oh, an all-state player, Ray Rex, and uh, Walter Fedora, an all-state player. These are both from Decatur High School. Wow. I don't even know what sp sport that is. Is that? <laughs> it looks like basketball, but I don't even know what sport that is. He's on the basketball. Yes, it did mean the basketball <laughs> team. There words. wasn't a date on that photo, so I couldn't <laughs> tell you exactly. But it was a really interesting picture, so I wanted it really to use is. it. It so. really is. This is a hoot. Here's one from 1907. Look at this. And, and unfortunately, in your position, you don't always know what you, what you got, do you? You, do, you look at it and you do your best, but you don't, mm -hmm. can't always write a story about it because you don't have any information, do you? You're kind of at the mercy of whatever someone wants put on that picture yeah. for you. And then he's Another go by state that. championship from 1945. Well, they were, it seems like they're winning every year. That's terrific. And that's Decatur High School once again. And we get into, uh, of course, some Stephen Decatur artifacts on that table, but then when you get into here, you're more into the Stephen Decatur uh, high school uh, mm -hmm. pictures is there as well, too. So, so we've come into the modern era when we, had, when we have three high schools in Decatur. Okay, well, let's make this corner here. And this is a story that I really like because a lot of people aren't aware of this, uh, Nathan. The, the Chicago Bears football, professional football team, at one time was, was located Decatur here Stalies. in Decatur, and it was called the Decatur Staley's, mm -hmm. named after, of course, the big company that I assume owned them, right. or sponsored them anyway. A.E. Staley, uh -huh. yes. And uh, as, we, as we look up here, we can see that this is, this is what the team would have looked like at, at that. That's the 1920 Decatur Staley's. They, those football uniforms were a little different too, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't have had much for helmets either. Mm -hmm. And they also, the Staley's were also a baseball team. That's right. Yeah, that was an era when a lot of, uh, especially big companies, had their own sports teams. They'd sponsor a baseball team. Mm -hmm. And uh, like Mueller had one, as well as we'll see later Linen Scruggs. So that was pretty common. Mm -hmm. And then George Hallis, who, who most football fans know, was hired as a coach and a player to play on the Staley's. And, and in 1921, when they made the move to Chicago, he went with them and then later became the owner of the team. Right. Wow. What a success story. I wish we had a picture of Hallis, don't you? Yeah. In, in, his, in his playing of, days? Yeah. 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 If you yeah. need to have, the Staley Museum would probably have one. And then we've got uh, Millican Sports here and uh, a, a, more pictures that, well, we do have some names. Neen Willis, 1912. Now that baseball uniform at least looks familiar. It looks like something that you'd, you'd associate with baseball. In 1905, up to our right here, the 1905 Millican football team. You wouldn't say those guys are real big, would you? No, no helmets. They got, they got bruises all over their heads. No helmets. Wow. Oh, four team right below it as well. Mm -hmm. Right here. This is 1904, yeah. And you got the names of the players on that, that helps. Um, Fred Long from Milliken, the baseball player here. Pops Long played four years in the Negro Leagues. He was a very successful player. I think he yeah. played football too, didn't he? 
Yeah, it was the first uh, African American graduate from Millican University. Really? Actually. So. Okay. And he also coached at the college level and uh, coached 35 years at Wiley College in Marshall, Texas. And he's actually in the National uh, Intercollegiate Hall of Fame. And, no kidding. And Millican's Hall of Fame as yeah. well, too. Here's, here's another Millican athlete, Marsha Mori. And she was, we see her in a swimming pool there. She was, she made the Olympic team, didn't she? Yes. Yep. Represented us in the 1976 Summer Olympics in Montreal. And now she's a chief district court judge in North Carolina. <laughs> Good for her. Good for her. What a success story. Okay, now, some of us have heard of Del Unser. I'm a, big, I'm a big baseball fan, and I remember hearing about Del Unser. I remember when he played with the Phillies, as, as we see him here in his uniform. Um, but he's got, he's not only from Decatur, but he's got, a, he's got kind of a long history with us, doesn't he? Yes, yeah, he's uh, high, played high school for St. Teresa, which we saw a section on them, uh, you know, earlier. Right, right. And, uh, yeah, he uh, still works as a scout with the organization, actually. So... And with the Phillies. With the Phillies. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, uh, apparently, based off what I was told by one of his friends who happened to come in the other day, that uh, he was actually the representative uh, at this recent baseball draft. Uh, he actually represented the team. So oh, if you were watching okay. the baseball draft and they pan out to the teams and the scouts or whoever the representative yeah. was at the table, it would have been, uh, it would have been Dell sitting there, actually. Yeah. So. so he's, yeah, he, well, that's a pretty high up if you're in, the, in on the draft. Bill Madlock, everybody remembers Bill Madlock. He was a great Cub. He won a number of batting titles, three or four uh, batting four, titles. I, believe, yeah. I think he played uh, third base for him, but Mad Dog, Mad, he was a tough, tough baseball player and a very fine hitter. And he's from Decatur. Grew up in Decatur, Illinois. Graduated from Eisenhower High School. Great player. And <laughs> more, more Decatur connections. I love this down here because I'd never heard of Chuck Dressen before. I heard the name, but I didn't know anything about him. <clears throat> Here we have a picture of him with Frank Sinatra, and this is at, uh, this is a field in New York, I think. But anyway, what's going on here is Dressen is managing the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, for three years, and I guess they have Sinatra out there to, to, to sing the national anthem or something. I would assume so. Uh, yeah. But he's meeting with him beforehand. Um, but he was an interesting fellow because he was he was five five. He weighed 145 pounds, and he played professional football, and he played professional baseball. So he must have been one tough kid. <laughs> yeah, played for the Decatur Staley's football team mm -hmm. as well as uh, baseball, <laughs> and became a manager right. and and uh, you know rubbed elbows with celebrities. Okay, people from Decatur probably know Fans Field. Tell us a little bit about Fans Field. It was uh, opened in uh, 1927, and it was uh, a really, really big field for that time. Uh, they expected, you know, with the Commodores and so forth, to draw good crowds and so forth, and, and they did. And if you see some photos here on the wall, you'll see uh, uh, you know, the aerial shots is particularly kind of illuminate how, uh, you know, what a, what a nice field this was at one time. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, in the 70s, it started coming into disrepair, and eventually it was just, uh, you know, basically leveled, and then the field is still there, but it's basically just mm -hmm. a, just a field at this point. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was the Commodore's home for for quite a while. You could uh, it could seat seven thousand people. Uh, dedicated in 1927. That's this is a good look at it down here, and of course I, I love it because if you if you're able to see all those advertisements on the wall, mm -hmm. you also get a good look at what what uh, marketing was like then. And uh, here's Rogers Hornsby visiting Fans Field in 1946. He's got a whole bunch of loving kids there with him, and he signed it. You can see where he signed his name on, on that picture. Up here, the Decatur Federals, they're playing at Fans Field. They were the precursor to the Commodores, basically. Is that right? So. Look, don't you love this? Look at this little this <laughs> pyramid here with the, with the ball on top and the catcher's mitt below it. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and there's an there's a aerial of Fans Field right there. Yeah, that would have been the place to go. That would have been the place to be. And I love this picture here, these Commodores. They nicknamed themselves the Commies. I don't think they did that on purpose. I don't think they knew what Communists were at the time, but Commies, isn't that funny? And this uniform right here, this goes way back. Do you have any idea how old this is? No, unfortunately we couldn't find a file on that uniform uh, in the collections, but uh, I'm guessing it's turn of the century based on the style. Mm -hmm. or, you know, not too far into the 1900s anyway. 
And it says Lynn Scruggs. Mm -hmm. What do you know about Lynn Scruggs? Uh, it was just a local company that was here, kind of a staple of Decatur, and uh, they sold uh, various goods. And we get around the corner, we'll see it, you know, some some uh, items and receipts and so forth that we had in our collections from from the old Lynn and Scruggs. But again, it was one of those companies that had a, a baseball, you know, baseball team like many of the large yeah. ones, large ones did as yeah. well. So okay, yeah. well, let's go see what else you got on Lynn and Scruggs. Okay. Well, speaking of Lennon Scruggs here, Nathan, everybody that grew up or knew Decatur knew about Lennon Scruggs. It was, you know, everybody had their department store that everybody sure. went to in Decatur. It would have been Lennon Scruggs for that period of time, which leads us into this other exhibit, which is from the 1920s, mm -hmm. which, is a, which is a new one. But to stay with Lennon Scruggs for just a moment, th this would have been the first incarnation of Lennon Scruggs up here. And this is a drawing, uh, an artist rendering of what the dry goods store looked like. And then down here, these are uh, as it as uh, the years went by. Uh, this is from uh, oh, I don't have a year on that, but I'd say that's probably the the uh, t oh teens or twenties, I guess. There's horse-drawn carriages in that one, and the back Bachman brothers uh, eventually bought it, right? And and there there it is there. But uh, they, they had uh, the team, of course, they sponsored the team, and they had those old uniforms. And these are the kind of items they would have sold, right? Sure. Yeah, it's, uh, hats, uh, clothing. Uh, it's a dry goods store. It had uh, kind of a variety of everything, kind of like what our J.C. Penney's nowadays, or you mm -hmm. think of some of the uh, earlier, earlier versions of it. So, um, but yeah, it was around for 100 years, you know, exactly, so 1869 to 1979. These little beaded purses are beautiful. You had these in your collection? Yes, this, this is everything in this exhibit's out of our collection here. Wow. Well, you're fortunate. You didn't have to go borrow anything here. No, it makes it a lot easier to <laughs> just go get it out of your own rooms. Well, let's take a walk around the corner here and take a look, because this would have been the period when, uh, when Prohibition, of course, occurred. And uh, uh, we always we always have heard of speakeasies and and uh, the flapper uh, dresses that the ladies would wear and uh, no different indicator was it? No, uh -uh. we had uh, we had a uh, crime in the twenties, thirties. <laughs> they had had all that going on and the you know speakeasies like you said and beautiful stuff. Look they at had these really, gowns. The clothing yeah. from that era was really. Really, pretty remarkable. You know, it's it's interesting because you can you could tell immediately that era. Uh -huh. There are, there are certain decades that you don't really know, but you know the twenties. Mm -hmm. Some of them kind it. of overlap into the other one a few years, whatever. But yeah. it, it's always it's always yeah, kind of distinct for the twenties. Really, really, you you've got a you're very fortunate to have the collection that you have. And uh, the Victrola, of course, everybody remembers that you you'd wind that baby up, and hopefully you'd. Uh, have enough juice to get the record played. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to replace the needle after almost every play. <laughs> Very nice. And then over here is the 1920s boudoir. And this is how a, I think probably a fairly wealthy lady mm -hmm. would prepare to go out for the evening. That would have been pretty nice stuff for the air yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Nathan, even aviation experts would look at this photograph and kind of wonder what in the world is going on there and be surprised to learn that in 1939, after two weeks of being on the air, this is how the pilots received everything they needed to stay in the air for two weeks. Yeah, Gas, no. oil, food, everything. It's phenomenal. That's yeah, pretty incredible. Uh, to be up in a little airplane, and that's not the same plane they broke the record in, but that's a, the best photo that showed the example of how they resupplied. So uh -huh. when they were in their little Taylor Craft plane, it was the same idea, and they literally brought their food, gas, oil, everything, up up by a clothesline and a bucket, oh, and they yeah, stayed in the air for uh, two weeks and I believe 43 or 46 minutes. So just we're talking there. about a pair named the Moody Brothers. Right. And the Moody brothers were from Dalton City, which is only 12 miles from the Decatur Airport. Sure. And uh, so they, they, in 1939, I mean, aviation was still young, very oh, young. Definitely. And these two brothers were young and adventurous, and they wanted to break this record, and they did it, and they did it by a lot. They stayed up for two weeks without, and this is a good picture. This is a good picture of them right here, because this shows them after they completed their task and uh, of course they're thrilled and unshaven <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and they completed this two weeks at Springfield at the State Fair. Right, yeah. State Fair was going on when the record was broken. But they flew all they flew all over the place. They went up they? through Springfield for the record, basically between Springfield and Iliopolis throughout that area. Mm -hmm. and they just sort of went around and into circles, and so they didn't go out away, you know, far away. But yeah. they just stayed. It was just more about staying in the air for yeah. the yeah. amount of time. So remarkable guys. And that's um, the Miss Springfield plane that was actually the one used when it uh, was oh, broken. Oh, okay. And the name so. was Miss Springfield. Okay. And that's that's a good picture of them too. That that uh, show, show them showing their stuff and. Here they are. They just look like farm boys, don't they? Yes. <laughs> and uh, did they did they work for did they work for the Wright brothers, or was that somebody else that, that we had? Uh, that was Lauren Hodge. Oh, that was Lauren Hodge. A little older, yeah. Okay. yeah. He was a pioneer in aviation from the area. But they flew the Moody's flew a Taylor craft, and and this wooden propeller would be very similar to the one that mm -hmm. was that was this on there. Yeah, just a little bit newer, but wouldn't wouldn't be much different. Yeah. I don't imagine. Yeah. Can you can you imagine? This this would uh, I assume this is a picture of the inside of their plane or one like their plane. Yeah, this is a different one. This is a more modern plane. Uh -huh. uh, we needed something we'd be able to blow up enough for a background. Yeah. So, but it gives a, you an idea small, of the space small, that you'd be in, sure. in with another guy for two uh -huh. weeks. Wow. Yeah, it would be definitely cozy like that, if not smaller. <laughs> and look over. Let's like take a look over here at at the goggles that that Hunter Moody used. This is uh, I love this because. I mean, if, if you have prescription glasses and you're going to be looking through these goggles for two weeks, you want to be able to see what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And so he took his prescription lenses out and he installed them into his goggles for flying, which is an interesting. It and is. You, you, know, you know the folks that, uh, that uh, loaned these, didn't you? Yes, uh, Tom and Mary Davey. Uh, mm -hmm. Tom would be uh, Hunter's stepson. So we're not sure if these were worn during the endurance flight, but they were his his uh, uh -huh. goggles for sure that he, mm -hmm. like he said, put his own lenses in and so forth. Mm -hmm. But whether they were the ones he was wearing that those two weeks, no one no one knows. Yeah. But uh, hopefully it was. But yeah. Either way, it's still neat. <laughs> it is neat because I mean, it's true, and this mm -hmm. is how he did it, and these are his goggles. So sure. that's the way it works. Now you mentioned a Mr. Hodge. Yes. I want to go Hodge. take. I want to go learn more about him. Okay. okay. Talk about early aviation in Decatur, Nathan. That Willard plane there is the first to fly from Decatur. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. First That's flight in Decatur. Aviation was born, and uh, gosh, we don't even know where that would have been. It, it, there was no airport at the time, so. No, it was just probably in a field somewhere. Mm -hmm. so. And the fella who was the mechanic on that project, uh, we talked about Lauren Hodge, and, and that this is this is that gentleman right here. He's in the, the Illinois Aviation Hall of Fame. Yes. He's from Decatur. And he also not only mechanic on that plane, but he worked for the Wright brothers. He did. Yeah. <laughs> what, an, what an achievement. He drove race cars in the early days of race cars and all, all sorts of things that were kind of ahead of his time, you know, and as far as his activities and interest. So the Experimental Aircraft Association here locally is named after him. It's the Lauren Hodge chapter. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So. You had some other famous aviators too from Decatur. Ellsworth Dansby Jr., one of the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, is from Decatur. Yes. Yep. Yeah, he's a, kind of a neat story. Him and his dad were both uh, prominent citizens in the in Decatur, Macon County. If I remember correctly, his father may have been a business owner, if, uh, if, I, uh -huh. if I remember, which is, you know would have been an era where that would not have been easy to do, being an African American. Right. Right. So. And then just to his right. Forrest Cox. Now this guy has an interesting history. He went to Millican, uh, piloted out of here in Decatur, but then he joined the Royal Air Force. He also flew for the Dutch Air Force, and then he was commissioned in the Army Air Force, which is where he belonged all along. Right. <laughs> what a yeah. wild life. And ironically died in a helicopter crash of all things. Oh, so that's a that's shame. A... Paula Cross. You're on the board and a volunteer here at the Macon County History Museum. And we're in the library because this is where you spend a good deal of time, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> For several months now, I've been spending quite a bit of time in here. We're going to talk a little bit about what, why you're spending time in here and what okay. you're attempting to do with these volumes, maybe thousands of volumes of books that the History Museum has. But first I asked if you would show me, a, you come across surprises all the time because you have to go oh, through the collection yes. and you're looking through things. And just recently, you all found a couple of documents here that have presidential signatures on them. So yes. would you show those to me? Oh, absolutely. Yes, I mean, just as you say, 
we didn't have a good handle on what was in our collections. Um, so we've been going through them. Karen Anderson, our president, has been going through the uh, artifacts, uh -huh. and I've been doing the library. What she found were several instances of land grants, and these date back to the 1830s. The federal government would give land grants to individuals for services granted or for veterans mm -hmm. um, in appreciation of their service. And these were always signed by the President of the United States. Yeah. Uh, we have one signed, or at least the signature says Martin Van Buren, and it dates to 1838, and it's to Jacob Spangler, who uh, got a land grant, and he actually built a mill here in Macon mm -hmm. County, which was very important to the economy. But perhaps the more interesting one is the one signed by Andrew Jackson. Uh -huh. And that was the 3rd of May in 1831. That's early. And what's so interesting about this is when Nathan and Karen started doing research, they found out that before, or well, in March or the spring of 1833, Congress passed a law that said a secretary could sign land grants because there were tens of thousands oh, of them sure. being granted. This one being dated by 1831 before that mm -hmm. means that this is an authentic Andrew Jackson signature. Uh -huh. Not done and by it one has of the been secretaries. Not see. done by a secretary. That's a terrific find. The other ones we have were probably all signed yeah. by a secretary. Yeah. So this is just a precious artifact it that really we have is. here it really in is. the library. Now, uh, show me. Uh, this, yes. There's other surprises that you run across. Oh, and this yes. little prayer book that you wanted to share with us. I just, I just love this story. Okay, as we're going through the library, we can find all kinds of very interesting things in the books that we find. And someone made a note in this. It's a little English prayer book. It's a little English prayer book from the Church of England. And it says, English prayer book sold at half price in London, immediately following Edward's giving up the throne because his name appears in the prayers. See page 189. <laughs> and it does name him as Edward R. King. Edward so, R. King. So the interesting thing about this, or, you know, kind of historically, is they must have printed up who knows how many of these. Yeah, yeah. And then they had to end up selling at half price when he abdicated the throne. <laughs> but that makes it more valuable. Oh, it makes it a wonderful <laughs> story to tell because you, um, you know, you just get a kind of glimpse, and someone realized that that was an important enough little tale mm -hmm. associated with this Bible that they decided to, yeah. you know, give us a hint yeah. of what was so yeah. important about it. And it's in our collection. That's terrific. Paula, thank you so much. Oh, you're quite welcome. Both, both you and Nathan for spending time oh, with us. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> We are here at the Macon County History Museum. They're preparing to take these thousands of books out of the old card catalog and put it digitally into some kind of sense so historians can come here and learn quickly and easily about what they have here. And if you'd like to visit the Macon County History Museum, they're open from Tuesday through Saturday, 1 to 4. But if you have a group and you want to come some other time, you can make an appointment. With another Illinois Story Indicator, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.